This video is brought to you by Squarespace. As you may know, my bionic hands Beta, Gamma and Delta got a lot of praise for having biologically inspired designs and having almost as many degrees of freedom as a real human hand. But they're also known for being some of the least user-friendly, hardest to build and most complicated designs out there. The Epsilon hand, my fifth generation, is designed to be the opposite. It's a hand you can build at home. But right now, it's not actually a hand which stays built at all, because as soon as you apply any pressure at all to the fingertips, the mechanism of the finger self-destructs. This is because I designed the whole finger mechanism to print together in one piece and move naturally based on a system of linkages described by Hyunjin Park et al. The mechanism prints in place and is self-contained. All of the pivot points are enclosed within the finger mechanism, except for one pretty important one, which was on the end of a long, flexible lever. In the last video, I threw this issue out to you guys to get some ideas and there were some pretty good ideas, but I really wanted to keep this finger design 100% print in place with no secondary processes, really for no other reason than I like the engineering challenge. My current pivot points are cones, which are easy to print in place because of the 45 degree overhangs, but a single cone pivot does not lock the two parts in position in any meaningful way. If I had a combination of a cone and then an anti-cone, a V-shaped pivot surface, the two parts would be fully locked, but the 3D printer would have to print support for the outer surface of the cone, which essentially starts in mid-air. So my compromise is to have this Diabolo pivot shape, but with one half removed, meaning that there's no overhanging surfaces and this can easily print with no supports. It's so satisfying when something you put a lot of thought behind designing works first time like this. Another experience I had recently, which reminded me of the satisfaction of a good design effort paying off, was the satisfaction I felt upon completion of my personal website, willcogley.com, all thanks to Squarespace. I'd been meaning to pull it all together for ages, but like most projects, I thought it would end up being a whole thing. Custom CSS, endless fiddling, inevitable procrastination. But Squarespace just removed all of this friction for me. I picked a template that already had a good structure, and then it was just a case of swapping in my own work, adjusting a few things, and publishing. One feature I'm very familiar with from YouTube, but wouldn't have necessarily expected to find with my own website, was the built-in analytics. Making content for YouTube, it's essential to know which videos my audience are most interested in, where traffic is coming from, which videos hold attention. On a website, you can get all the same benefits, plus it can really help you fine-tune the layout, so for example, I can find out which links people are most interested in and then redesign to make sure those are the ones that are most accessible. I also liked how easy it was to add custom code blocks where needed. If you want to keep things simple, you absolutely can, but if you're a bit more technical and want to embed a widget or tweak some behavior, you're not locked out of that. For example, I already had a Notion page with my project database and I found a widget that would let me embed it directly into the new site. So if you've been putting off building your site because it feels like too much, Maybe this is your sign to start. Head to squarespace.com to try it free. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Will Cogley to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So now I'd managed to elegantly solve the pivot point issue, my attention was now drawn to this big ugly switch, haphazardly screwed on to the side of each finger. Now the idea here is that because with all of these tendons and pulleys and with all of the tension in the system, the fingers need a way to continuously update their position in lieu of any kind of rotational positional sensor. So the fingers have a limit switch, meaning that whenever they're in this position, they have the feedback to say they are where they think they are. Do you ever wonder why a mobile phone lasts several years of hourly daily use, while other gadgets like printers, gaming controllers, and headphones have a fraction of the lifespan? Even though we're using them a lot less, it's because mobile phones have almost no moving parts, other than the 0.5 millimeters of travel on the volume switch. So for this reason, I decided to switch from physical limit switches to Hall effect sensors. It's basically a switch which is triggered by a magnetic field, and it means I can find the home position of my fingers without any physical contact. Now, I just gave this whole spiel about the elegance of fully self-contained and print-in-place mechanisms, and here I am haphazardly supergluing sensors with big ugly hand-soldered joints onto the side of my beautifully optimized design. 
what I would really like to do is to design a tiny custom PCB to house the Hall Effect sensor and maybe give it some kind of adjustable mounting so that I can fine tune the home position of each finger. And you already know I would design it in Easy EDA and get JLC PCB to make it. As for the electronic system, last time I used this pretty simple board which drove all of the servers from a Raspberry Pi Pico. Since designing that one, however, I had worked on my robot head, wherein I designed a much higher power and more robust board for that. And that one coincidentally used the same number of servers, so I decided to order some extra ones from JLC PCB with a few modifications to allow me to use it in this design. The key difference is that on my mouth design, all of those servers had their own positional sensors, and so I only needed to send commands directly to them. But now I have signals I need to process for my homing system, and so I need a whole load of new inputs for those. Thankfully, with the design of the Epsilon hand, I had really given a lot of thought to the cable management system ahead of time, and it meant that all of my new signal cables could be easily routed through the carpal tunnel and into the control board. Just try not to look too close at the base, it does get more prototypey the further down you go. Once I got everything powered up, I had a great time working with this board. When I ordered it on JLC PCB, I specified that it should have extra thick copper and big power connectors to cope with the high current of all the servers running at once. And cope it did as I clumsily crashed the motors about, learning how to control the joints. I know that I can always trust JLC PCB to deliver excellent quality boards, and that's why I'm always glad to recommend them. Add in the fact that they're exceptionally fast and very low cost, and you have yourself an unbeatable service. So thanks again, JLC PCB. So now I'm building the control logic. The first step has to be to home the fingers, because at startup, they have no point of reference as to where they are. So firstly, each one moves to zero and gets its bearings. I have a pretty big issue that the thumb seems to be too long to home itself in some positions. So the first step is for the thumb to home itself and then get out of the way to allow the rest of the fingers to home themselves. I then have a script which estimates each finger's position based on how much time has elapsed since it last updated, with updates running every couple of milliseconds. I have to admit this is a kind of brain dump style programming where I've just thrown down some lines of code and got something which works, but I'm pretty sure it's super inefficient. Each finger is its own instance of a class which separately checks and tracks its own position based on the time elapsed. But I think there must be a smarter way to check the time once and then update each finger based on one main clock. As a result, I can see that I'm overstressing the processor and sometimes getting weird behavior like when I have too many servers moving at once, I'm getting some crosstalk with servers copying each other, and occasionally the fingers are just not cooperating at all. The other part that I'm developing in situ is the Unity control platform using the Leap Motion controller, or Ultra Leap as it's now called. I definitely don't think Unity is a necessary part of the system, like there's no reason I can't just go directly from the Leap Motion controller to the hand, but for now, I really need to see what's going on visually in order to figure everything out. I built most of this system when I worked on the previous version of the hand, but the more I delve into it, the more I can see it's actually just not really working correctly. At a high level, the way it works is that it finds the position of each bone of the hand in space. Now, obviously that's far too much information because we don't care about my hand's position in space. We care about each bone's position relative to its parent bone, which will give us joint angles. So I get the position of the parent bone and then find the difference between the two. And in theory, that gives me a target for the servo to move to. The difficulty comes from the fact that I have to do this using quaternions, which are a really smart, but really scary way of defining position and rotation that Unity likes to use. So I attempt to find the difference between the quaternion defining the palm's position and the quaternion developing the first finger bone's position, and then I try to convert that into degrees. But there's all kinds of cases where maybe I don't know which axis I should be using, or maybe there's an angle which goes down to zero and then instantly wraps back around to 360 degrees. Basically, I thought I understood this when I worked on the Delta hand, but now that I understand it a bit more, I've realized that I actually don't understand it at all. So right now, I'm not comfortable with releasing this design publicly. I will be changing how the sensors mount, the housing, the electronics, and making sure that there are no collisions. And I don't want to release a design that doesn't work. So for now, this design, including the code and PCB design, will be available on my Patreon page along with the CAD designs of all my other projects. 
but don't worry if you're looking for a free project to make, I have a ton of those on my project archive too, and highly realistic eyeballs and control boards available for sale on my website. So a great big thank you to everyone who supports me through Patreon, YouTube, and on my shop, nmrobots.com, and also thank you guys for bearing with me while I move around. Soon I will be setting up the CogLab V2, which is going to rocket fuel my dev process and video quality. But for now, I'm stuck in the kitchen. Thanks guys, and see you next time.